Good evening and welcome to tonight's uh, webinar <laughs> from classpet.net. Sorry, it's been a long time. We're a little tired. Yeah. <laughs> Today's title is How Are Congruency and Similarity Connected? Gra Geometry Shape Explorations with classpad.net. Uh, for the sake of webinar quality, we are going to keep everyone muted and all videos turned off. If you do have a question, please type it in the chat panel and both the presenter and I, the moderator, will be um, respond back or will respond back to the group and we'll be monitoring that. My name is Amy Chow and I am the National Training and Product Manager at Casio. Um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we have Dr. Karen Greenhouse uh, presenting for us tonight. And I'm going to just pass it on to Karen. Hello, everyone. North Providence. Hello, Daniel. Nice to see you. Um, Karen Greenhouse. Uh, I think a lot of you are familiar with me by now, so I don't need to go through to my spiel. Um, so tonight's webinar, and I'm going to change the screen right now, is hopefully you're going to play along and, and join me. I'm going to be sharing some things and I really want you to join. But today we're using classpad.net. Um, if you're not familiar, we can go over some things at the end because I don't know that we'll actually run the whole hour this time. But I'm using classpad.net. I'm going to be really focused kind of on the geometry, but on different ways to connect similarity and congruency. So um, just for those of you who are not familiar with classpad.net, it's free. It's a web-based um, dynamic math software. You can pretty much do any math that you want. I use it all the time for my algebra, my geometry, and just and statistics in particular. So it does everything in one place. So we're going to focus on the geometry today. And uh, so I'm going to log into my account. So those of you who don't have an account, um, you can still play along with me today. I'm going to be sharing things. But if you want to save any of the things that we do today, creating account allows you to save that. So I'm going to log into my account just to show you um, what that means, where you can save. So I'm logged into my account. If you don't have an account, it looks very much like this, except you don't have this little save icon up here. So everything I do because I'm in my account is automatically saving. And I'm going to share a document with you probably a couple times tonight um, because I'm going to be changing the document. So I want you to get the changes. And when you have an account, if I send you an, a paper to open, it opens up as just a copy. But if then if you want to save it, in your own account, you have this option here called duplicate, which allows you then to save the paper in your own account. So we'll go through that when I get there. So I'm going to go into my paper. So when you have an account, everything you do is saved. And I started in a paper earlier that I was working on right here. So this is what your account looks like if you have one. So notice I have folders. You can create folders pretty easily right up here just by clicking it, naming it. You can do folders inside folders. So it's a great way to organize all the work that you do or the papers that you find. So here's the activity I was working on and I am going to open it in a new page. So I right clicked and said, open in a new tab. And I like to do that so that I can toggle quickly between my papers and what I'm working on. So that's, that's why I tend to open it in a new tab. It just, it makes it easier to work with. So here's this um, document and we're going to be focused on this one document. I'm going to share it a couple times because what happens is because of the auto save, if I add anything to it, it will update it. And if I send it to you right now and then I add something to it, you'll only have the previous version because my version is being updated constantly. So I am going to send it to you a couple times probably. But I wanted to talk about similarity and congruency. They're usually taught. Uh, how many are, if you want to just raise your hand, I think you can do that um, somehow, right? I haven't used that very often, but, or you can just respond in the chat. Um, how many of you actually teach geometry, like the geometry course? I know that if you teach uh, elementary and middle school, you're doing geometry as like maybe a section, but how many of you teach geometry? I see a couple. All right. So awesome. So just a real quick question. When you think about similarity and congruency and teaching that in a geometry course, which one comes first usually in, in the lay, what's the layout in the, the normal sequence? There we go. So it's usually congruency. Exactly. And Daniel, thank you very much. I am going to try to convince you today that you should really do similarity before congruency, which is, you know, totally messing up everyone's geometry curriculum, but it makes more sense. Um, 
So that's sort of the goal of today is to kind of show you that similarity really is what students know first. It is their prior knowledge. And why don't we start there and then build that understanding of congruency? So what do I mean by that? Well, I, I was looking through um, prior knowledge here I was, and I'm using the common core standards just because uh, that's a pretty standard, pretty standard standard. That doesn't make any sense, but it's a standard that even though the states say they don't have common core, they are all using, or 42 of them are using common core standard in some form of, or another. They've changed the name of it, but it still is the common core. So that's, I tend to use that as sort of my uh, standards that I look at. So in sixth grade, that's where they're introduced to ratio and proportion. And that is a really, really important understanding prior knowledge that's needed for both congruency and um, similarity. So that's happening in sixth grade. In seventh grade, they're still continuing to work with proportions and then they get introduced to scale factor and scale drawings. And so if you think about that scale factor and scale drawings, that is similarity, not congruency, right? So I have just an example here. Part of seventh grade is looking at scale drawings of, of buildings or looking at pictures and scaling them up or scaling them down. So this is an example of something that they might be doing in seventh grade, which is working with similarity. We don't call it similarity. We're calling it scale factors and scale drawings, but it is similarity. If I have a blueprint of a building, I am taking that small drawing and trying to build the actual large house by using a scale factor. So one thing that I think is a nice connection, if you're in this seventh grade is to actually, a lot of times we tell them the scale and then we say, what's the real size of the bedroom or, or things like that. This is kind of a, a twist on that to get them to really think about what does that mean? And if you notice in this image, it's giving them the real world measures, even though the picture is a scale. And so what I I'm going to ask you to do in just a minute is, can you use your geometry tools? And so I'm just going to briefly, for those of you who are not quite familiar with, with ClassPad, this is a geometry sticky. And I know that because when I click on it, here's all my geometry tools. And I did not mean to make a dot there. Um, I'm going to ask you, this is something to do with students. So they know that in the real world, if they're looking at this picture, this wall right here from, and that, that's what this means. This wall from right here to here is 12.6 meters long. Well, what is it in the, in the scale drawing? How could you, what, what is the scale factor? Well, we don't know what the measure is in the scale drawing. So I'm going to show you two different ways to think about it. And then I'm going to send this to you and have you try to try to give me and justify a scale for this. So one way that you could do it in the geometry sticky you could add a grid. So a lot of times when you work with students, especially in the, the lower grades, graph paper, grid paper is a really nice tool to help them understand scale because you can use the blocks as a representation of the scale. So like two blocks is the same as one foot in, in real life, right? So you could turn on a grid. So if I click the grid, probably this one and maybe some small blocks, minor grid and hit grid and okay, that brings a grid up behind. And now maybe could I use these blocks to come up with a scale? How many meters are to one block? And that would give me a scale and then help me determine maybe say the dimensions of the bedroom. So we're kind of doing it backwards. So that's one option. I'm gonna turn it off because I'm gonna let you decide. So I'm gonna turn off the grid here. Another way to think about it is you could actually use your segment tools, right? You're measuring and you're gonna measure on the picture. And that's the nice thing about being able to insert images in ClassPad. So this is just a picture um, that I, let me just show you, I kind of hit it, but I just inserted using our image tool down here. I just inserted a picture of a scale drawing. So it's just a picture and it gets centered at the origin and I didn't change anything about the picture, but I can now, because I could insert a picture, I can now do geometric constructs on top of it. And that's a really nice feature. So let's, another way to try to figure out a scale is to maybe like follow this length. So I'm gonna get my straight edge tool, a segment, and maybe I wanna go from there to there. I'm trying to match up with the lines there. And then I could 
use my geometry measuring tool. So click the segment I just drew and measure its length and use this in my scale. So it kind of just depends how precise I'm going to be. And then is that inches, is that centimeters, is that whatever? Um, so just a couple ways to think about it. So what I'm going to do is undo everything I just did. And I'm going to send this paper to you. And I want you all to decide what is the best scale that's being used in this scale drawing. So we, we know the real life dimensions. What are the dimensions? What's the scale factor that is being used to help us determine the lengths of the walls um, in the image? If I want to know what's the area, say this bedroom, I need to know what its actual, you know, lengths and, and widths and stuff are. I need that scale factor. So I'm going to want you guys, all I want you to do is figure out the scale factor. Couple things that you can do. Um, backup settings. You already know how to turn the grid on, but you can also turn on length units. So if you notice when I measured that length, it didn't have any units behind it. So I can turn on a unit. Now, does it mean it's actually that unit? Not necessarily. So I could, you have to decide what which, which makes sense. Is it a centimeter? Is it a millimeter? Or is it a meter? It doesn't make sense that it's a meter because we know that's not real. So the units don't necessarily, they're not, um, what is the word I'm looking for? They're not to scale. So, so I was going to say they're not that, to that, scale. That doesn't make sense. So <laughs> you could turn on me uh, on these. I don't know what the, it's, it's actually pixels probably, but um, up to you what you decide. So I'm going to send this to you. And so the, for those who have not seen this before, when I create a paper in my account, so this is another advantage of having an account, you can share it with anybody by going up here to the three dots. So three dots, if you haven't seen, figured it out, are really important in ClassPad. They mean that there's more in their settings. So I click the paper overall, three dots, and go to share. I can keep it private. No one can, else can see it. I can create a URL. So this is what I tend to do with my students so that I can share the URL. Or I can make it public, which means other people who are ClassPad members or have accounts can find it. Well, no one needs to find this because they won't know what to do. I'm just going to copy the URL. I'm going to send it in the chat. And all I want you to do is open it up. You're opening it as a guest. Um, and then I want you to come up with what you think the scale is. And then we'll just in the chat kind of talk about what method you chose to do. So I'll just give you guys a couple minutes. And I do say that there's a question. Is there a way to increase the number of digits displayed? Yes, that, that's in the settings. Um, and that's true in graphing, whatever, if you're doing things with numbers, if you go to the settings, you'll see down here, the number format and default is fixed at two, but you can go all the way up to like nine decimal places and you can do scientific notation. You can do, I'm not quite sure what the difference is between normal and one. I tend to keep it at least at tenths, uh, because of rounding issues, especially in geometry. So at tenths is you probably don't want to go to just units, but yeah, that's the way you do it. So I'll give you a couple minutes. And all we're doing right now is looking for what's, what scale would you use? Um, so we already know the larger dimension. What would be the smaller picture dimension that we have? And when you're done, you can just maybe type in the in the chat panel what you think and and what method that you maybe came up with. You could have come up with a different method than the one I used altogether. That's the beauty of this. Oh, I, I'm just reading the chat now. I like the discussion about how you could drag the picture to fit the coordinates. And that is something, and really instead of dragging, you might even want to change the, like where the center is, which kind of moves it up or down. If you just tweak it a little bit, it makes it fit nice on a corner. 
we're going to be playing around with all of this in a little bit too. Like how can you manipulate images to really kind of help students make connections? So we are going to do that in just a little bit. So great. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Recursor? Segue. <laughs> Segue. Yeah, that's it. All right. Anyone have? Anyone have any any suggestions for what they think the scale like this is a slightly different type of challenge that I think is a little more fun than here's the scale what's the new thing is figure out a scale yourself and then based on that what would be the dimensions of the bedroom or the master or whatever and it would be different for every student maybe and but they'd have to justify it so that's sort of how I like to approach things Anyone? I hope someone has an answer because I actually didn't do it because I was throwing it on you guys. So <laughs> I'm hoping y'all come up with some ideas. We could probably even share someone's screen if they want to. Anyone? No one? Come on. Oh, sorry, Daniel. Internet lagged out. So, and another a good question for students is, is do they have to do more than one segment if they're doing the segment option? Or I mean, how many um, blocks do they have to count? That type of thing. And how are they going to figure that out? My personal preference, especially because I worked with, like if, if this was seventh grade, I'd probably want to do a grid. Um and using the grid, good. Yeah, I'd, I think I'd want to use the grid and I'm not sure I'd have to play around. So this is the small grid, which I think might be a better grid. And here's where you can play around with the, the picture image because dragging it doesn't change the grids, um, like lining up to a corner. So yeah, I think lining it up to a corner. So we kind of want it to go down a little bit, which means we want to change the, the center a little bit of why so down would be a negative so maybe what if i did negative 0.4 does that get it down on the line oh you uh, didn't add the negative i didn't add the negative so there's that okay eh, pretty good right and then mm -hmm. if i want to move over just a little to the left so i want to do a negative i'm going to say 0.3 so pretty good, right? So that's mm -hmm. how I would manipulate. I wouldn't try to zoom in and out. I would I would try to manipulate where it's centered, you know, and it just plays around. But notice how quick and easy it was. So now you could actually count the blocks. And so, um, and yes, Daniel, exactly. And we're getting to that. It is going to be a introduction to transformations. I am a huge believer in letting students play around and come up with the idea of it before you actually do anything really super formal. So here we're doing scale. And so if you did a grid, you could, you could count all of the grids up to here. It looks like it's a really nice, even grid. And then that's your scale. So 12.1 block is equal to, and you'd, you could get down to a unit rate, all of that type of thing. Every student might come up with a slightly different, depending whether like they're measuring the outside or the inside walls, those types of things. If you did the segment, you might have a totally different type of scale because you're using a segment measurement. Um, so lots of different ways to think about that. And all of this is really similarity. This scale is helping us go from something big to large, or in this case, we went from the larger measurements down to the smaller scale drawing, right? And there we go, 1.9 meters is equal to one unit. So that's the block, I'm assuming. Um, so that's, and then you could have a really nice discussion about what's the unit. Well, in this case, the unit was a block. Um, what's the unit in someone who maybe used the segment? Maybe theirs might be a millimeter or an inch. So those types of things. So this is all prior knowledge. This is seventh grade. We're doing this stuff in seventh grade. Then we move into eighth grade and eighth grade is where they officially start talking about transformations, congruency, and similarity. And similarity is almost always after congruency. And what I want to show you is that it really should be before because they've already got this understanding of scale and proportions, right? That if I multiply something by a scale factor smaller than one, I am making it a smaller shape. Same, ex same exact 
um, shape, but the size or the sides are smaller. And, and I don't know if they've talked about angles yet, but they understand that scale factor is either enlarging something or shrinking something. So why not then introduce similarity? So I'm going to show you another example. So you have the paper and if you scroll down, you'll see, this is a typical, um, example of here's this, uh, picture and it, it's usually an animal. I saw a couple with elephants and stuff and it tells them the scale two units on this graph paper is six centimeters and the hen is 16 units tall. What is the um, actual height of this? Is it a chicken? Hen, a hen. So even though they have an image, they're really just doing a calculation, right? But they're understanding that the real chicken is larger than the graph is showing. So that's a calculation sort of similar to what we did up here. Well, I want to kind of take that and make it a slightly different um, representation and have them do their own scaling. So if everyone who's got this open, if you click and open a, a open your own geometry screen, that's blank. So let's open a geometry screen and we're going to kind of walk through how to work with the grids, which is really nice. So instead of giving them an image, this is in my opinion, a very simplistic problem. Um, so we could make it a little more challenging and a little more connected to this idea of similarity and scale by doing our own changes, right? And we're gonna start off really simple and then I'm gonna go into uh, some more ways to work with dilations basically. So I'm taking the understanding of scale and moving it into dilations kind of slowly. So if you have a geometry sticky open, I want you to turn on the grid. So I'm gonna say, turn on this grid to the left, the square one, and then turn on a major grid as well. Um, and then grid. So these three things are checked and we're gonna hit okay in a minute. But before we do that, I want you to look at this section here called snap. So this is really important because right now I really want everything to snap to a nice, um, number and you'll see why in a minute. So I can hit snap and it'll snap nicely, or I can hit fix and fit the difference between snap and fix is snap. You can kind of get almost there and it, it, it will still let you kind of be halfway in the middle of a grid. But if you do fixed, it forces it to go on to a uh, intersection of a grid. So I like fixed for an activity like what we're about to do. So I'm going to suggest you hit fixed. Um, and then when you're all set, so I've turned the grids on, I hit fixed, and now I'm going to hit OK. So all of it's set. And what I want you to do is to get your polygon tool and make, let's do something really simple. Make a rectangle that's not a square for some reason. And just kind of make it, doesn't really matter where, but just pick a point to start and just make a rectangle that is not a square. So it can be wherever you want. All right, so I've made a rectangle. So if you notice the fixed forced me to put my um, points on a vertex of grids, like where grids are intersecting. Um, and that's what you want. Because in this particular case, whatever your rectangle is. So everybody right now, tell me what the dimensions of your rectangle are just in your chat. So mine happens to be, a, and I'm using the blocks, a two by one, two, three, four, five, a two by five. So mine's a two by five. I'll pull up the text here and write that in. I have a two by five as my original shape. All right, so we've got an eight. Oh, some of you made really big ones. That's, that's good. Um, and a three by five and an eight by 12. Okay, so here's what I want. And sort of the same idea here. I want you to pick a scale. I want you to create your own scale. So for me, I might say each block represents our unit. And I want you to enlarge your shape. Actually, maybe we, let's, let's all do it the same. I want you to enlarge your shape by a factor of four. And I want you to draw your new shape, right? So I want you to take your original shape, which is probably blue, and make draw an enlarged shape that's similar, but you used a scale factor of four. And we can change the colors for those of you who are not familiar. Before we start constructing, if you click that and go to properties, we can change the color so that our new shape is gonna be red or whatever color makes you happy. So you're gonna 
you're going to make a new shape that is four times larger using a scale factor of four than your original. And when you're done, I want you to tell me what its dimensions might be or are. Oh, I hope I have enough. Yes, there we go. All right, so does everyone have their dimensions? And here's where we're trying to get into this idea of what is, what is similarity using what we already know about scale, right? So I asked you all, you're in eighth grade now, I, and so you should understand how to do scaling scale proportions, those types of things. I want you to tell me like how much, so my new dimensions are, I did it four times bigger, eight times 20, right? So what do I know about this shape? And now have them start comparing. Um, well, they both, what's the same? What's different? What, how are they related? And you can say, well, this is four times bigger. Well, what does that mean? And you can say, well, every side, this is two, this one's gonna be four times bigger. So this should be eight. If this one's five, its corresponding side is four times bigger, it should be 20. So having them make those connections back to seventh grade where they already understand or have been using proportions and scale factors and scale drawings and say, well, these shapes are now what we call similar. So now based on what you already know about proportions and scale factors, what does that mean to be similar? And so they can say, well, I've, I already know. I already know that it means the sides are have the same proportion, right? And I already know that the angles are the same because it's the same shape. I just made it bigger or I just made it smaller. Um, they can talk in blocks. I like to do it on the grids because we can talk about that unit of blocks and, and they can measure visually versus having to measure uh, using a tool. Now you could add in an actual measure because you're in geometry and measure, oops, and actually measure the lengths and see if the lengths that the geometry tool measures are four times different. So we could measure, you know, the length of this, which is one. And so if our geometry measures, what do we automatically know that this one should be? If I'm using the same scale factor, it better be four. And let's, you know, fingers crossed that everything works out here. It's four, yay. So you could really make a lot of connections. And now all you've done is you've taken what they know already. They already know about proportion. They know about scale. They know about the scale factor and talk about these are now what we call similar figures. So scale scaled figures that are related by a scale factor are called similar figures in geometry because they have sides that have the same proportion. They have angles that are the same. They have it, the proportional relationship that you already understood, but we're now going to call these similar figures, right? So that's where we're going. Um, and obviously you'd go smaller too, but we're not, we're going to keep moving. So the next thing I want to do is, okay, so now how do I connect that to dilations, which are what we use to make similarity? And this is where we're going to bring in congruency as well. So now students have done this little, we've used prior knowledge about scale and proportion. Now we have an understanding of what similar figures means, right? It's proportion, sides are proportional, um, angles are the same, shapes the same, but one's bigger, one's larger. So we understand that. Now we're gonna go into dilations as an extension and from that use congruency. So an ex excellent point time. You can definitely go into this with the area of similar figures. And that's where I would definitely go. This is why similarity should come first. So what I want you to do, and I'm hoping you all can do this along. Yeah, I think you should be able to do this with me. Um, so open another geometry sticky. When all else fails, I like to just start fresh. Um, and I want you to take your polygon tool and make another polygon and make it kind of big, all right? So we're gonna make it kind of big and it can be whatever polygon makes you happy. Don't make it super crazy, you know, not like a 10 sided one, but you know, something interesting. Just make a polygon and everyone has their own polygon. I like to do this with students that they're, I'm not, we're not all working on the same shape 
but the end result is the same. And that's sort of where you're going to come up with those rules or those patterns that you're looking for. So if everyone has a different shape and yet everything we do ends up with the same kind of discovery, that's how you're getting to your patterns and stuff. So here's your, here's your shape. And before we do the next thing, so I'm going to be dilating, we're going to do a color change. Cause I like color is a really important visual for students. So before, once your shape's done, let's go up to this arrow on the right or the left, depending on where your sticky is and change your color. So pick a color that is going to stand out with the blue. Um, I'm going to go orange. And now what we're going to do is we're going to good question, Daniel convex or concave. I personally like them to, uh, we're going to explore both. So, but it doesn't matter. I don't like to tell them. So, you know, it's good to do that too, because the rules are basically the same, no matter what. So you're, that's a great question. Um, I let them just draw whatever makes them happy. Now, what do they tend to draw? They tend to draw convex because that unfortunately is what we tend to draw. So here, there, I'm going to leave mine where it is. All right. So what I want you to do, we're going to do a dilation. So we're making the next step. We understand what similarity kind of means now. What's a dilation and what does that have to do with similarity and congruency? So, and I like to do dilations before all the other transformations and you'll see why in just a minute. Um, so let's, let's click on the shape. So make sure you're in the arrow tool, click on the shape and we're gonna go and make, so kind of make sure it's highlighted. It just gets darker. And we're gonna go up to construct and we're gonna to go to dilation. And you'll notice up here, it tells us to select a point. So a dilation requires a point of dilation, which means a point where it's gonna make the, sh the shape shrink to or shrink away from. So we're gonna use in this particular case, a point in our object. So I would suggest you can pick any point. I like to pick kind of the bottom left one, depending on what my orientation is, but it's up to you. Pick a point somewhere on your, shape, one of the vertices, that's going to be where your shape's going to dilate towards. So that's all this means. We're, we could have a point outside, but I want to do it inside the shape for a reason. Um, so we're going to click that. And, and then notice if when you did it, notice it's asking us, well, what do you want the dilation to be? And this is where the connection comes to our scale factor. Well, a dilation is simply telling the computer at this point, how, whether we want to make it a larger dilation or a smaller one. So we're going to give it a number. So let's do one half. So you can actually on ClassPad type in, use your keyboard down here and do one divided by two. And I like to do this because I, they see the actual scale as a proportion, but you'll see that in the sticky itself, it becomes a decimal. So that's a really nice connection between fraction and decimal. So let's make our dilation one half for right now. And then once you have it, hit execute. So what happened? And again, prior knowledge, we just did it with a dilation. What happened? And what's the connection? That's where we're really going. And so what they're going to hopefully notice is, well, the new shape, my dilated shape, it just looks like it took the original and shrunk it, right? And how much did it shrink it by? Well, it looks, it says one half and over here, 0.5, that's also one half. So I, what do I already know about this new shape, this dilated shape? I already know that it is supposedly half the size of this. And this is back to that nice connection to area, but what's half? Well, this side looks like it's half of this side. And I could now take my measuring tools and measure and confirm that this a, B prime is half of A, B. And what am I doing? I am, oh boy, that sounds exactly like what we did with scale factor. So a dilation is be really just a geometric term for scale factor, right? Dilation, if it's a number smaller than one, is going to take my object and make it smaller, shrink it down by that scale factor but what do I already know about this? I already know that everything is the same in my new shape, except for the lengths of the sides. It's the same shape. If I measured the angles, they're the same because all I've done is formalized my scale factor into this word dilation and made a similar object that's half the size of my original, right? So 
lots of connections. So now I could say, okay, well, what if I want the object to be larger than, what if I want the orange one, my new shape, my dilated shape to be a larger image? Well, they can go up here and change this number. So everybody change it. And it depends how large you made it. It may go off the screen, but make your dilated shape have a scale factor that's going to make it larger than the original. So there's, I'm not going to tell you what numbers, but with students, they can pick lots of numbers and you tell them, you know, how'd you know? So I'm going to pick my own number and I'm going to make it just be crazy. Why not use a decimal? And it looks way off the screen. This is where zooming is a nice feature. I could click on my screen and I'm just using my mouse to zoom to show that it's my new shape's now a lot larger. And I could compare the length of this to the length of that and show that the ratio of those is 2.7. Um, so lots and lots of different things that you could do to explore and connect back to that prior knowledge. And we have, we're still talking about similarity, but we've made it connect back to our prior understanding of scale factor, right? So you could do lots of things that way, but now I'm gonna show you how to create a slider where now we're gonna bring in congruency, all right? So go to your dilation and instead of using a number, we're going to replace the number with an alphabetical letter, a variable. Um, and it, it could be the nice thing about class pass. It could be, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It could be multi-character. So if you wanted to say dilate, that's fine. I'm just going to use a small lowercase d. Um, and in, so we're not putting in a number, we're putting in a D. And what happens is when you hit enter or execute, it interprets that as, oh, you want a slider. You want something that can change its value. Um, and notice that it defaults to a value of one, right? Um, and so what do I notice about that? It's telling me that my dilation or my scale factor is one. And so what do I notice? What does everybody notice? when the scale factor or that dilation is one, my orange shape or whatever color you chose is exactly the same. It's the same shape as my original. Ooh, and that is still something similar, right? They're similar, right? They're exactly the same. And so when they're exactly the same, I can pull in that word now. That means they're congruent. Congruent is a special case of similarity. Congruent is when the proportion the scale factor is one. Every ratio is one. The angles are still the same. We already knew that about uh, similarity, but with, with congruency, everything's the same, the same shape, the same size, even the sides overlap, everything is the same. So congruency is a special case of similarity. Um, and so, and then what I like to do, but before we go, notice that the default of the range here is negative. So it's a good kind of question. Does it make sense if the scale factor is, um, you know, changing our size? Can we have a negative size change? It's fun to explore it. If you guys want to see what happens when it goes negative, it might confuse them. It it goes off the shape, so it goes in the opposite direction. It's still the same. Like if let's put it at 0.5, so you can see negative 0.5 would still, this is half of the original, but because of that negative, it kind of reflects it is, is, a, is a way to think about it. Um, so you may not want to do that. You could just change the um, range to not go past, not go past zero, but that's sort of up to you, however you want to think about it. But here's what I like to do. I like to, uh, you know, move the slider and, and sometimes animate it so that they can see what's happening. So as my dilation increases, my shape gets larger and similar. It's not the same, but then as it's, and when it's really small, um, it's smaller than that. And the only time it is ever exactly the same is when the scale factor is one. And we call that instance congruent and congruent means everything about it is the same. And, and right, scale factor means a dilated reflection, neat composition. Yeah, I agree, Tom. So this is just kind of a fun way to now connect similarity to congruence. And now you can go from there. So they already have this great understanding of similarity, which is why it should come first. They have proportions. Now we understand similarity. And now we've kind of figured out, oh, there's this special case when things are congruent, 
where everything about them is the same, let's now explore some congruent transformations. So this is where it's fun to bring in. I like to not work with measures and numbers first and give and give students um, an understanding of what those mean, words mean before we actually get into the rules and the patterns, because if they have the understanding going in, then when you add in the numbers, it's all just connected to that understanding. So I like to work with images a lot, especially in class pad. And so I'm going to, um, there's a couple ways I'm going to do this. I, I'm going to send a file. It's a picture image to you in the chat and you can download it. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to kind of walk you through how to upload an image if you've never done that before, because this is, you know, a nice thing to know how to use in ClassPad. So on the same paper, we're going to open a new geometry sticky. So if you're able to download it, if you're not able to download it, I'll send you this paper again once I down upload the picture. But if you can download the picture, we're going to upload it into geometry. So this is a picture of a bunny and I just, you know, grabbed it off the web. So open a new geometry sticky and we're going to insert an image. So if you've never done this before, here's my geometry sticky. And when I click on it, oops, I always do that. Where it has the A down here across the bottom with your tools, where it says A for text. If you, if you click that little um, expand thing, you'll see there's an image icon in the middle. So let's click that. And this basically is saying, okay, go get an image somewhere. So I just sent you an image. So wherever that downloaded to, that's where it is. It's called the brown bunny. And I'm going to go get mine. So you're going to click in that kind of hazy uh, thing and go get your brown bunny. So when you click on it, it shows up into this screen. So you see that you have a bunny here in the screen. And if you're okay with that, you're going to hit okay. And what's going to happen, it's going to put it into your screen. And so let's just talk about this little uh, sticky right here. So this controls the image. And right now the default always, whenever you upload an image is that it's gonna be centered at zero, zero. And notice we're in the geometry, we don't even see zero, zero. If, if it helps you, you could turn on the axes just so that you see it. So this bunny is being centered wherever the center of this image is, that's where it's been centered. I don't like to have it in my geometry for a reason. So I'm going to turn it back off. Now, I'm going to ask you to download the bunny again. So I'm going to ask you to or upload, upload the bunny again. So we're going to have the same bunny on the screen twice. So I'm going to hit, I'm going to go back to my geometry. I'm going to hit the image thing again. Notice it brings up a second image. So you can put images on top of each other. You can, in, you can change where they're located. So I am going to ask you to upload the bunny again and hit okay again. And notice doesn't look like anything happened. And well, that's because it's the same picture on top of itself. I'm gonna ask you to put, notice how you can move the pictures to front or back. Now it doesn't make a difference right now because they're exactly the same, but I'm gonna have my original one stay in the back and I'm gonna have my second one go in the front. Now it doesn't look any different because it's the same image at this point, everything about it's the same. But if you had two images that were different, you could see the two different layered ones. So why am I doing it this way? Well, I wanna show you what happens. We're gonna keep my original bunny. Um, and before I forget, is there anyone who was not able to do this? Cause if you're not able to do this, I'm just gonna share this paper again which on my paper has been updated. And so if you open it now and you weren't able to do the bunny yourself, you could now open this paper and you'll have the bunny. So different way to get to it. All right, what we're gonna work with now is this um, second image. We're going to use these little areas here to change the second image. First one's gonna stay exactly the same. But the second one, which is in the front, is going to change. And so what was our first connection? We've already talked about dilation. So let's dilate the second image. Let's change it. And so that comes into its dimensions, right? So its dimensions are its <sighs> dimensions. Again, that doesn't make any sense. But let's change that by a scale factor. So let's shrink 
the second bunny by half, right? So I'm going to change its width, its dimensions, and its height by one half. And it, it happens to be really nice dimensions here. So I can do this quickly in my head. So all you have to do is click on it and just change it to the number you want. So we're going to cut it in half. And when you are done, hit execute. What happened? Well, my second image, which is exactly the same as the first one, but the only change that I made was I cut it in half. It is now the same picture, half the size. What do I know about everything in this image? This bunny's ear compared to its original bunny ear. What do I know about it? In the chat. It's half the size, right? So we're just we're just taking an image and connecting this whole idea of scale. So if I want to make the a second bunny bigger than the original, I would change the dimensions by looking at my original 10. I make I need to make it bigger. So I can make it bigger by many things. What's one thing if you look at this proportionally, if you notice width and height are the same. So as long as I change width and height here the same, I'm gonna get a proportional bunny. If we want to think about that exactly, Daniel. So everyone change your second image to something that is um, bigger than the original. So larger, a scale factor that's larger. And it can, it, as long as you keep them the same. So I'm just going to make mine relatively easy here. So mine's like one point. So it doesn't look like it's different because remember the second one's in front. So it's larger than the original. You could switch this. You could send it to the back and see that it's now bigger than the original. So lots of ways you could play around with it. So that's just playing around with what they already know, um, dilations. But now let's start thinking about those other, remember we're in eighth grade now and we're talking about transformations and congruency. We already know congruency means exactly the same. So let's, let's explore some congruency, some transformations that keep things congruent. Dilations obviously don't keep things congruent unless there's a proportion of one where they're then congruent. Um, so let's play around with our bunny, our second bunny. So now what I want you to do is the center is X and Y at zero, zero. So let's change just X. So let's make X be a negative number. So everybody make your X be a negative two. Oops. Change your bunny back to its original size. This is important because we're working with congruency. So change your second bunny back to 10, 10 if you, if you have it dilated. But now move the center X, right? So let's look at what's different. Same size bunny, meaning everything about it is exactly the same. It's the ears are the same. They have a, a ratio of one, right? That's congruent. What's different about this? If I change the X by a negative, well, it looks like, remember the second one's in front, he moved over to the left a little bit. He just slid. So here's a transformation where he's just sliding, he slid over to the left, but he's exactly the same bunny. Nothing about him changed except his location. He slid, he transformed, he translated over to the left. So that's a transformation that keeps my original and my image congruent. They're exactly the same except for what? Location. So now, and you can, you know, hopefully you'll see where I'm going with this. You can have lots of fun with this. You can say, okay, well, how would you make the bunny move to the right? Or what if you wanted the bunny to move up or down? And so they could explore translations really easily and quickly simply by moving a picture. And they're not really measuring anything, but they're making, they're seeing that I haven't changed the dimensions at all. So I know they're exactly the same. They're congruent. What's different about them, what's transformed is where they are on my screen. Um, so that's a really fun connection. So this, the changing the X and the Y will change the horizontal and the vertical. So this, these are how you can really just explore um, translations shifts. So let's set, set it back to zero, you know, and you could have fun. You could put a grid on here. If that makes you happy. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you could do. You could add the grid on and you can say, well, can you make the bunny end up in 
this great section up here, what would you have to do to, to make him move that way? Right. So they'd have, they say, well, I know I've got to slide him over to the right, which is the X and I've got to move him up. So maybe I make him go five to the right and up. Uh, let's see, let's make him go up five. And so let's see. Oh, he ended up. Yay. That was a pretty good guess. Um, so I moved him up front. So you could have a lot of fun with this and really just helping students understand what it is. What's a translation? What, what's it doing? What's a transformation? Why is a transformation transformation called a rigid transformation? Well, it's because it didn't change your original. Yet your bunny is still your bunny. He's exactly the same size. He just changed where he was located. And now let me, I'm looking at my time here. I actually went a lot longer than I anticipated. I gotta stop talking. So so center X and Y will help you explore translations. Width and height uh, help you explore similarity or dilations. And then this one right here is going to help us explore rotations. So the angle of, let me set this back so he's back the same. So if you change the angle, you're going to turn the bunny. So if I... Um, Let's just type in a number. We'll make it be 45 degrees. So now my bunny has turned. So did he change size or anything? No, he, he is exactly the same as he was before. He's just turned slightly different. And so now we talk about rotations and how rotations are also rigid transformations because they keep the proportion at one, the relationship, they, they are congruent right? Their similarity is, has a proportion of one, so it's congruent. And again, you could then combine this. Could you make the bunny turn upside down and end up over in this quadrant? How would you do that? So lots and lots of different things. The only one um, I have not been able to figure out how to do with an image, mainly because class head does not let us actually select the image as an object in geometry yet. I'm hoping someday they let me do that. Um, because reflections cannot be done just by manipulating some of this stuff right here, or at least I haven't figured it out. If somebody can figure it out, that'd be fantastic. But, but even if you make this be 180, that's a rotation, not a reflection. So I could not figure out how to make it be a, a, a reflection um, using just these shifts right here. But... If anyone has an idea, that'd be great. So I'm kind of, I'm going to stop here because uh, I've sort of kind of reached where I was going. I just wanted to show you that if you understand where students have come from, thinking about similarity connected to ratio and scale factor first and introducing it as this proportional relationship, and that's now defined as dilations, and it's just the same as proportional proportion and scale factors, and then using this understanding of similarity and scale factors and dilations, we can then connect using dilation that a congruent figure is just a dilation with a scale factor of one, or it is a special case of similarity, just like a square is a special case of a, of a rectangle or a special case of a parallelogram, a congruent figure is a special case of similarity because it has a proportion of one. So that is, that is my ending. And hopefully you all have this uh, paper you can play around with. And if you have any questions, let me know. Um, if not, we will say good night. I really appreciate you guys playing along with me. Um, I'm looking at your question here. I'm wondering if there's a way to set an order for different transformations to show students that the order matters in certain situations, some transformations. Um, you can do that. If you've not worked with actual, I was trying to avoid the official um, transformations, but if you if you just show a polygon up here, I'm just gonna make a polygon and let's do a reflection and then a translation. So I'm gonna use a vector. So, Let's say I want to show, I want to do a reflection over a line and then a translation of a shape. So I'm going to change my color first. Um, so all I did was draw a shape, put a segment in for my reflection, and I put a um, vector in for my translation. 
you can do translations a couple ways, but I just want to sh- try to answer your question, Daniel. So once I have this, I'm going to change my color. I'm going to take this object. Whoops. Ah. There we go. Sorry. And I'm going to do them in the reflect, then translate, right? So I'm going to select it and reflect it first. Oops, I did it wrong. Sorry. So you select your object, you go to your construct menu and you hit reflection and you tell it what line to reflect over. So there's my reflection. So here's my reflected image. And now I want to take this reflected image and translate it. So now I take the reflect, let's change the color again. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of color because it helps students kind of follow. But I do like that in, in ClassPad, when you do any transformation with points already labeled, it automatically puts the prime in, which is kind of um, interesting. So now I'm going to select the second, the, the image that was just reflected, and now I'm going to translate it. So I'm going to say construct, translate. So notice translation, you can do it with coordinates or vector. And I'm just doing a vector because it's it's easier to um, control right now. And so there's my vector. So here's my end result. So the question that you raised, Daniel, is if I did it in the reverse order, if I took this shape and first I translated it and then reflected it, would I end up in the same position? Is it, is it commutative? Meaning does it, does it not matter what order I do it in? So let's see if that is true. So let's um, try to match up the colors again. So this time I'm going to take my original shape and I'm going to translate it first. So I'm going to translate it. And then I'm going to take this, really bothers me. There we go. I'm going to take the translated shape and I am going to reflect it, right? That's what we're doing second. And you should already tell that it's not going to, and I should have changed it to green, right? Hold on a sec. Let me start this over. We're trying to see if the green things match up. So let me change my color first. So take this second shape that was translated, and now I want to reflect it. So I just did. And did I end up with the same exact? shape. It is the same shape, but it's definitely not in the same position, right? So does what does that mean? So it, it's fun to explore that. And it's pretty easy to do. Um, you know, so is it is it commutative? Is translation? Do I end up with the same thing? And when do I end up with the same thing? You know, is there a certain type of composition of function of transformations that let me end up in the same thing? So any other questions? Hopefully that answered your question, Daniel. Okay, perfect. All right. <laughs> so, so I'm done. I've been rambling, I know. So uh, hopefully you guys had some fun with this. Thank you, Karen. Let me Thank get you. the PowerPoint going. That was really fun. And that was a different way to, like you said, um, take a look at dilations and translations and rotations using imaging, um, like actual images versus just shapes. So that's very cool. Let me share my screen real quick. And we can just wrap things up quickly. So thank you guys very much for your time tonight and just yeah. exploring and being interactive and working with us. Um, it's always fun to have a very interactive webinar. Um, we have a few more webinars coming up. As you can see on the screen, these are the ones that are for our hardware and for classpad.net. Um, you can sign up on either of these sites and we'll include these links um, in the um, follow-up email that we send out tomorrow. Um, we are also still doing a um, series with TOTOS um, called Distance Learning in Access, and it was actually kind of cool tying into some of the things we talked about last week of giving students a choice, um, you know, letting them choose what number they want to, you know, how they want to change things, um, or even picking the shape, you know, something as simple as that kind of, I guess, um, allows them to, you know, fully in, be in what am I trying to say? Engage. Be empowered engage, and engage. Right. Empowered, yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so we hope you're able to join us on the next two in the series. Um, these are a little bit more focused on distance learning for English learners. Um, so 
join, um, we hope you can join us for those. Um, and then lastly, as we wrap up, don't forget to follow us on social media. Um, and um, as always, if you are interested um, in a certificate of attendance for um, what, attending one of these live webinars with us, we will de most definitely send you one of those. Um, and we'll have this webinar recorded and up on YouTube tomorrow as well. So thank you guys very much. All right, good night. Thanks. I guess I didn't end quickly like I thought. Sorry. <laughs> but it was exciting. Okay, good. Yay. <laughs> All right. Night, guys. Good night.